So to compensate for this, it was decided that Fairchild 3 would be removed from the most wanted list. So now you can play it freely, just like DNA Tracker. Um, it's a powerful piece of ice, right? Uh, nothing in the new meta has rendered it less powerful. If anything, um, the removal of certain niche uh, wind conditions on the corp side, which we'll get to in a minute, um, makes Fairchild 3 all the more powerful because, you know, if Glacier Dex becomes strong, Fairchild 3 is your go-to Glacier Ice. Um, neither does it expand uh, the diversity of the HP faction. If you notice, HP has very few competitively viable archetypes, and Fairchild 3 doesn't really breathe new, uh, new air into HP. Um, you know, uh, it doesn't really help Nyx Ice decks. Um, it, you know, it could help uh, the small agenda HP decks, those that sacrifice agendas to the runner and play sports metal and fast break and all that stuff. But it doesn't really solve that archetype's problem in that it just completely dies to uh, some runner cards like Shadownet and Artist Colony. And, you know, brain damage HB is very far from becoming a thing. Fetch Out 3 is not going to really help with that. So, yeah. Uh, it doesn't help on the front, which is a pity, but not much will anyway. Um, the designers always had a very hard time, you know, diversifying HB. And by clamping down on combo HB, which uh, was the ban on cerebral imaging, you know, HB just got even less diverse than it was before. What? This does hopefully is so is to allow HB to gain at least some representation at the top tier of play. I think HB would kind of not be on the map anymore if uh, nothing was done about Fairchild 3. Specifically because most of the strong HB decks nowadays that are not CI decks rely on Surveyor to create those taxing remotes that you need to score those HB agendas. With Surveyor on the restricted list, HP decks just got worse, so Fairchild 3 is some sort of compensation for that. Moving on to NPE decks, negative player experience decks. Uh, these uh, make people very sad, these make people very mad, these make people want to quit the game, so we better ban these cards. Um, yeah, we are going to talk about them in a minute, but one thing that, uh, was pre uh, that happened recently was that in Rain and Reverie, a bunch of cards that shuffle agendas back into your deck were released. Now, these cards were pretty balanced, they are no, by no means Jackson Howard, but uh, in combination with certain existing cards, uh, cards like Drudge Work and uh, so what's that called? Attitude Adjustment, adjustment I think. Um, you know, when a critical mass of these cards are used in tandem, uh, they can have very nasty effects, uh, enabling those prison decks that we want to absolutely avoid. Now, it's very hard to define negative player experience because obviously it is very subjective, it differs from person to person. To me, what I think uh, NPE decks uh, clearly exhibit are decks that do not attempt to uh, win by scoring 7 agenda points at all. These decks are terrible uh, because, you know, they completely circumvent the natural tempo of the game. The corp needs to draw cards from their deck until they eventually run out of cards, and cards like Drudge Work and other agenda shuffling cards, you know, go against that. Uh, prolonging games is never something you really want, so, you know, we need to clamp down on the number of such available cards in the card pool, which is what motivates uh, the removal of certain NPE cards. Right, so with all that said, let's look at the NPE decks that were suppressed with the new most wanted list. Firstly, Mill decks, Potato Unleash, which is, you know, uh, the main receptacle for all these Mill decks, is finally on the restricted list. Now, there's nothing wrong with a Potato every now and then. However, what competitive players have discovered is that the, the best Potato decks don't bother with scoring agendas, right? You would think that, you know, a fun way to play Potatoes is to score agendas uh, uh, proactively and aggressively, like House of Knives and Viral Weaponization. These are nasty agendas for the runner while advancing your own game. The problem is, there's an even better deck than that, and it doesn't involve scoring any agendas other than House of Knives, which won't win you the game. All you need to do is to play lots of inevitable net damage cards that the runner uh, can't really counter, aside from net damage prevention, and then they just get ground out uh, ultimately, when they run out of hit points, no cards left in stack, no cards left in hand. 
uh, and there's a very large number of such cards in the card pool. Kakugo, right? Uh, mo most breakers can't deal with the net damage effect of Kakugo. House of Knives, you know, once it's scored, every time you try to make a run, you're gonna take net damage. Breach Dome, you can't really avoid this card at all unless you don't run Archives. And if you don't run Archives, they're just gonna stash all their agendas in the bin. As well as cards like Neuro EMP and Snare, which you're just gonna run into every now and then. So too many inevitable net damage cards that make middle decks very strong to the point where the corp doesn't even need to bother with scoring agendas when they can just sit back and deal net damage. With Potatoes Unleashed on the restricted list, what this does is that it removes one of these net damage cards that force damage on the runner, and a very important one at that, Obo Carter Protocol. Because this agenda is also on the restricted list, you can no longer play these two cards in tandem. What this means is that at least now the runner has a fair shot at getting 7 agenda points before they take too much net damage. Previously, Obo Carter Protocol you know, made uh, stealing agendas hell because basically half of Potato's deck uh, agendas are Obo Carter Protocols in terms of agenda points. So stealing one put you very far back in terms of surviving net damage, subsequent net damage, which made it that much easier to grind the runner out. Now, hopefully, uh, what this means is that now that uh, Potatoes Unleashed is forced to play fairer, less defensive agendas, um, runners can hopefully steal enough agendas to win by playing aggressively against uh, such a passive deck as a prison mill Potatoes deck. I mean, it's always unfortunate that a newly designed archetype had has to go in the bin because, you know, it was causing unfun play, but that's exactly what Potatoes does. Even though milling is a legit strat, um, it is nicer if uh, milling was not a main win condition or rather an only win condition, uh, which it is right now uh, in, with the current state of the game and that's why it has to go on the restricted list. It's not out by any means, it's just a lot harder um, to create a deck that can uh, both mill and proactively score at the same time and hopefully impossible to create a mill deck that just mills and doesn't score agendas. The other NP deck that was hit was Museum Decks. Museum of History finally has gone where it deserved to be all this while. I have no idea why it took so long for them to put it on the banned list. It was on the restricted list for ages and we've seen 54 card decks come and go and those were never really fun to play at all. The reason Museum of History needs to go on the most wanted list is because it can recur anything. And that includes uh, the critical mass of cards that we talked about earlier. Drudge work uh, by itself is fine because drudge work can only put agenda spank to R and D. Uh, once you put agenda spank in R and D, you run out of power counters. Drudge work goes in the bin; it stays in the bin. Museum of History allows you to put drudge work back into the deck. It puts agenda spank into the deck. It even puts other copies of Museum of History back in the deck. What this means is that the game can go on forever and you will keep finding these cards that just keep putting agendas back in R&D again and again and again. And this limits the amount of decision space for the runner because agendas are nowhere to be found but R&D if the corp is running a critical mass of such cards that put agendas back in R&D. This is arguably degenerate because it, yeah, it just reduces the decision space, it makes the game less meaningful, less fun and the worst thing is Museum of History also puts other cards back into the deck, cards that are meant to be only played once, like Operations, Door to Door, Hard Hitting News. The court can just keep landing these again and again as long as Museum of History is on the table. It prolongs the game unnecessarily and doesn't lead to much fun gameplay. I know people disagree about this, but it enables you to create decks that never need to score agendas at all. Who needs to score agendas when you can just keep uh, putting your win conditions back into the deck time and again and just keep playing them while the runner slowly grinds themselves out. It has to go on the most wanted list because of that and not just on the restricted list, it needs to be banned outright. In fact, this card should never have been printed in the first place. What were they thinking? Oh wait, it's the Mumbat Cycle. No wonder. Right, okay, enough said about Museum. Let's move on. That is archived in the Museum of History for good. The third NPE deck, uh, ar archetype should I say, is all rooted in... Scorpios. Rig Shooter is not fun. Some people don't enjoy playing against it. Some people hate getting their breakers removed from the game. And that's about it. 
Because when you think about Scorpios a little more, you realize that it's actually not very dissimilar to other Wayland archetypes, in, particularly Ru in particular Rush Argus that has hard hitting use boom um, as an alternate win con. In such an Argus deck, you punish agenda steals by uh, playing hard hitting news after they make a run on your agenda and then bag them by killing them with meat damage. Scorpius does the same thing. You try to score agendas early, if the runner runs, their, uh, their programs get sent into the nether world. They get hunt, Hunter Seeker uh, and they get program trashed. It's pretty similar. The only difference is the alternate win con is different. Instead of killing the runner, you kill their rig. It's not very different. You're still trying to score agendas. Have you seen a Scorpius deck that plays prison style? Well, those were the days of yore back when, I don't know, um, uh, Mumbat City Hall was still free to roam. I don't know. Nowadays, most of the competitive Scorpius decks are decks that actively try to score 7 agenda points. Oak Towns, Atlases, Hostile Takeovers, you name it, they score it. They still need to score quickly, because if they don't, they're just going to lose to a very well set up runner that has lots of sacrificial constructs on the table. Um, so this is the main difference between Scorpios and Potatoes. Potatoes enable a deck that doesn't try to score 7 agenda points at all, whereas Scorpios is very much still a Rush Whalen deck, and for that reason, I don't consider it negative player experience at all. Uh, now, some people might argue that Scorpios is NPE because the runner can potentially land in a board state where it's impossible to win, they just sit there twiddling their thumbs waiting for the corp to score out. And that's a perfectly fine reason. I mean, I would feel like I'm knocked out myself, but there's always the concede button, right? Whether in real life or not, if you think you have no way to get into servers anymore, just concede. And yeah, uh, removing Scorpios as a viable uh, alternate win condition, you know, rig shooting as an alternate uh, deck archetype has other impacts as well. Firstly, it reduces the corp archetype diversity, which is very big shame because that's exactly what the designers have been pushing in the recent cycles. You print stuff that enable different win conditions like milling, um, like you know, feeding the runner negative agenda points. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. You know, you know, you have all these new win conditions that add spice to the game, and now you're just removing them again. Uh, and that's, I think, regressing a bit. Um, it also renders an intentionally designed combo void, right? Terminal Directive was designed, at least the Wayland side, with Scorpius and Hunter Seeker as a combo in mind, and now that is completely off the table because they're both on the restricted list. It also encourages runners to deck build a lot more greedily. They, are, they can now, you know, it's basically a boost to the runner side because now they don't, will never have to worry about playing one-off breakers anymore. Especially with clone chip off the most wanted list, they can certainly afford to pl uh, skimp on breakers while playing three clone chips to make sure that they will never um, run the risk of losing the breakers. And I think that's a pity because it just gives the runner too much insurance and it makes runner play too safe. I think Scorpius was a unique way to punish runners that, uh, you know, skim too much on breakers. Uh, back in the day, uh, and run base Andromeda was very popular, and they often got very greedy by reducing the number of breakers they had to play so that they can play more powerful operations and, sorry, events and more powerful economy cards. Um, and that's being very greedy, in my opinion. Um, the other thing about Scorpius is that now that um, the what you call that, the Conspiracy Breaker Suite is still in play, it's still in circulation in the card pool. You know, without Scorpio's defense systems, how do you expect to deal with those breakers? Rick Shooter becomes completely off the table, right? Without Scorpio's defense systems, you'll never be able to rig shoot anyone that plays Conspiracy Breakers. And um, if you do play Scorpio's, because it's on the restricted list, you can't play Hunter Seeker. With, and with that, you can't get rid of the Conspiracy Breakers at your own volition anyway. So yeah, I'm not very happy about Scorpios getting restricted. I know some people don't like Scorpios at all, but well, where's the diversity, may I ask? Um, 
the other big problem with restricting Scorpios is that you fall into the same problem as the Zero Clan Vengeance combo that I talked about earlier. Remember I mentioned that the worst possible thing they could have done to Zero Clan Vengeance is to put them both on the restricted list? Because that means that you piss players off that uh, like Zero only, or those players who like Clan Vengeance only. Uh, and the same thing, this exact same problem happened to Scorpios and um, Hunter Seeker. Right? Now that they are both on the restricted list, you are pissing off people that want to remove their opponent's breakers from the game and play Rick Shooter. You also piss off those people who want to play Hunter Seeker somewhere else as a, you know, some, as a punishment card for stealing agendas. They can't really play it without sacrificing a lot from the deck because they are tapping on the restricted list for a card like Hunter Seeker instead of something more powerful. So yeah, it doesn't leave anyone happy at all. What I would have much preferred to see if they really, really wanted to break up this Scorpio's Hunter Seeker combo was to simply ban one or the other and leave the other untouched. In this case, Scorpio's defense systems would probably be the one to go. I think Hunter Seeker is a perfectly fine card and one that, um, you know, it punishes greedy runners, runners who deck build very greedily, greedily, but also, you know, provides the runner with another way in which, sorry, the corp another way in which to gain tempo. You trash one of their key cards, now they have to spend time digging for another copy of it while you advance your own game. I think that's pretty cool. And um, yeah, it definitely should not be something that is res uh, restricted, especially since it's uh, that uh, the powerful two card combo of Hunter Seeker in Scorpios is now no longer available. So yeah, uh, by putting both on the restricted list, it basically just restricts uh, diversity because there's really no reason to play Rick Shooter anymore. You are not going to spend your restricted slot on any of these cards. Okay, now we've covered all the Corp and Runner cards that were on the list. However, there are a couple of cards that I think should be on the list but were not put there. The first is Rebirth. People have some very strong opinions on it, and I think for most casual players, you, uh, you guy, you, sorry, you lot would generally like the presence of Rebirth in the card pool because it does something very unique. To me, Rebirth reeks a very bad design, not because of its identity swap mechanic, but because it is one per deck. That's the worst sin. Uh, it makes decks very unreliable, inconsistent, and you can't really plan around playing Rebirth. Um, it also ignores the balance of identities. It's the same as Brian Stinson and those kind of cards in that, you know, <coughs> you uh, um, something like Valencia into Omar, you know, allows you to play an Omar deck with an unusually high power level, one that has more influence that was than was meant to be, and one that has more money than was meant to be because Valencia's ID ability doesn't get removed on rebirth. So you're essentially playing with two IDs in one. That's, you know, doubling your identity power level, which is very ridiculous in my opinion. And that's what rebirth does, because it doesn't differentiate between identity abilities that do something at the start of the game and identity abilities that, you know, have a persistent effect throughout the, the game. You would see this effect uh, in action in other factions as well, but you know, Andromeda, Andromeda got removed from the card pool. Otherwise, uh, Andromeda rebirth into something else would be very prevalent right now, I would think. So yeah, uh, the fact that um, it ignores ID balance, the fact that it's an unreliable one-off, and also the fact that it reduces starting identity diversity. Why start off as Omar when you can just start as Valencia and rebirth into Omar when you need to? Right? I think that's one of the biggest problems with Rebirth. You know, instead of increasing your starting ID diversity, instead of seeing lots of fun runner IDs, everyone's just playing Valencia. You can blame Valencia all you want for that, but I think uh, being able to Rebirth into a runner that can attack archives is a big part of what makes regular Valencia very strong. And I would have definitely liked to see Rebirth get hit. Um, it's not that the other Anarch IDs are weak, it's just that Valencia is the best starting ID and the rest are good rebirth targets. So rebirth, I think, really is the problem here. Next card, Maxwell James. Uh, it's pretty ridiculous that you can use it as a breaker uh, because you can de ice ice uh, after encounter and does not have to break the set ice. While still serving as your source of link, 
and economy denial at the same time. Maxwell James does too much in one package for only one influence, it's way too good. End of story. Now, I think it would be on the most wanted list if not for the fact that there's a rumoured most wa- uh, errata coming up for it in that you can no longer use it as a breaker. It will no longer work as a DRES card if my sources are right. Uh, this should come up in the next update of the uh, FAQ, the Netrun official FAQ. The thing is, FAQ updates are issued separately from most wanted list updates, which is why the most wanted list was updated, but the FAQ um, hasn't received an update yet. It hasn't been announced yet. But I think we can expect this change to come. And when that happens, Maxwell James should be fine, hopefully. The final card I think that should be on the most wanted list is none other than DDoS. I've been saying it for a very long time, and I'm still kind of in awe that people are letting this card slide by. With the push towards fair decks that encourage interaction with ICE, you know, with sideline uh, alternative win conditions like milling and rig shooting down the drain, runners need to interact with ICE now. You know, games have to be fair, games have to be fun, we want to play with ICE. DDoS says, no, I don't want to play with ICE, I just want to get past your ICE and play Apocalypse on you. That's not cool. That's not cool at all. DDoS works very well with Apocalypse because it renders one ice on each central server blank. That's three pieces of ice that DDoS gets past and then after that all said ice go into the bin because Apocalypse is that strong. Um, this combo is pretty stupid and the worst thing is the corp doesn't really have much recourse. A lot of uh, ice resin cards have since rotated out and there are not that many viable ice resin cards left in the card pool to counter DDoS. Um, it also makes run events very uninteractive, right? Instead of having to brave through a DNA tracker or spend clicks on the Fairchild 3 to land your diversion of funds, well, just get past the ice, 100% guaranteed because DDoS works like that. Um, not being able to raise your ice is not a lot of fun and DDoS, you know, does it in a way that, you know, uh, it's... It's just not very fun to deal with. No one, I don't, <laughs> I, I, I'm really struggling to see how DDoS is a card that increases fu- the fun factor of Netrunner. Um, and it really doesn't help that it is further boosted by recent cards that allow it to be recurred, like Reclaim, which can recur a virtual resource, which is exactly what DDoS is. Um, now that Hyperdriver is on the most wanted list, half of Diaper is now dead, but half is not enough. Diaper needs to die in the fire, and I think DDoS needs to go where Hyperdriver belongs, in the bin. Right, so that's all about uh, the most wanted list. Now to move on to the part where I'm sure you all have been waiting for, what I think are competitive archetypes post most wanted list. We'll start with the runner side. With clone chip off the most wanted list, I think it will come as no surprise that Shaper is probably going to be the top faction again. Um... <laughs> Yeah, and there's not much to say about that. I think there's going to be a lot of powerful Shaper archetypes out there. Simply, simply because Clone Ship does so much to increase Shaper consistency and economy as discussed earlier. I think the biggest sleeper might actually be Smoke because as Corps move towards fairer strategies again, strategies involving Big Ice uh, or Rushing Out, Smoke is the one sh- runner that can deal with that very, very well. Smoke doesn't need to worry about face check punishment because she has self-modifying code, bring out the right breaker at the correct time, and she's super efficient at breaking big ice. She can lock your remote and she can make money while running. Smoke is incredibly powerful and I'm still kind of astounded that nothing has been done about Smoke to this day. I don't think Smoke is a very fair runner to be honest, but eh, I guess this is not the place to rant about it. Other Shaper decks include Pawn Shop Haley. I think this will be a very interesting deck archetype. Now that uh, Aesops can be played and Clone Ship in the same deck, Pawn Shop Haley becomes a lot more powerful and a lot more viable. Or people might go the Pirate route instead. Uh, pirate, for those of you unaware, is uh, Tech Traders. Well, that's not pirate part of the Pirate Suite, but Gabali, Conga Battle, and Grappling Hook definitely are Pirate. Those, you know, non-breaker breakers that trash to get you into servers. Just got more powerful because you can now recur grappling hook with clone chip. 
which is off the most wanted list. For the Anarch faction, regular uh, Conspiracy Breaker decks are still going to dominate the day. They were powerful before and they haven't really taken a hit from the most wanted list. So they're going to remain powerful as always. Uh, Max will now take the limelight as well and shed bask in it with Valencia because it's number one mortal enemy, Scorpios is no more. So you're going to see regular Max running Levy as the restricted card, whereas Valencia will probably stick to Employee Strike. For the criminal faction, I think the one um, ID that will see the most resurgence is Geist, simply because um, Clone Chip is now available as an option for Geist. Don't forget, Clone Chip has a trash can on it. It synergizes with Geist and Tech Trader. You could definitely make a case for playing it with the... Um, you know, crowbar shift and uh, spike, but you could also play the same old Omaqua Dean De De Lister combo or go with the pirate suite like Pirate Haley. I think guys will be relevant in the meta because um, it doesn't really have to worry about Scorpios and uh, doesn't really have to worry about fast advance decks either. If fast advance decks are pushed out of the meta thanks to the sheer number of Shaper Clot, which Smoke is, which Pawn Shop Haley is, which Pirate Haley could be as well, then, you know, Geist's worst ma nightmare matchups are gone, and, you know, matchups like Glacier and Kill, which are still viable and probably will become more viable in the coming days, are very, very easily handled by Geist. So I think these are the runners that people have to look out for. What are the cords that you can play? Well, to start off, there is Sports Metal Rush. Um, I'm not a fan of the sports metal decks that feed the runner agendas and play lots of small agendas because you just don't win quick enough. I think rush decks, solid rush decks that run cards like Arella Salvatore that allow you to score your agendas much faster is the way to go. And with that, you can play either Global Food or Surveyor as your restricted card. Now that you're not restricted to playing Fetch Out 3, you know, you could go for a defensive agenda suite or you could go for defensive ice with Surveyor. On Ginger City Grid. Hard hitting news decks will still be number one in my opinion. It's still the best way by far to protect an early Rashida Jahim. So expect to see still a lot of hard hitting news decks in the uh, in the meta since uh, hard hitting news and all the tech punishment cards have not been hit by the most wanted list at all. No matter which variant of uh, hard hitting news decks you're playing, you're almost certainly running global food as your restricted card. Whether it's Argus Rush, whether it's an outfit deck that makes lots of money, or whether it's Tempo CTM. Um, another viable uh, NBN archetype is current overload Asmari. This one's pretty interesting. Uh, Asmari has always been a strong identity because of its ability to make boatloads of cash. Um, in the current context of runners that run a lot of resources, I'm looking at Pawn Shop Haley, Geist decks, um, Anarch decks as well, uh, Pirate Haley also. Basically, all these runners that you see here all rely very, very much on installing their resources at the normal price. Smoke is probably the exception, but even then, not being able to play daily cards and net mercure early could be a problem for Smoke. Because of this, scarcity of resources is going to be a very powerful card in the upcoming meta, and Asmari is best positioned to play it. Um, eh, for what reason? Well, um, I we've seen some Asmari decks around that run lots of scarcities and even archive memories to recur said scarcities. Uh, with Cerebro imaging out of the picture, which is where the other deck which you see a lot of scarcities run, um, <coughs> Asmari seems like a most natural place to put it in because uh, you can really take advantage of that credit differential. You're making lots of money off your identity ability while suppressing that of the runners by forcing them to pay more for their resources. Scarcity is already a natural card to play in Asmari simply because you don't want to be employee struck. That's a lot of money down the drain. So yeah, Asmari with Scarcity seems pretty powerful uh, considering the meta. For the Jinteki side, Jinteki is still a strong faction and uh, uh, most of the Jinteki decks you'll see will be the Glacier style decks. Uh, you, um, People might think Mti Wekundu is the Glacier deck to beat, but I think uh, Rush Palana definitely has a place considering that the, met the runner meta might be a bit faster nowadays. However, I think the real sleeper here is actually Ag Infusion. Some people might think that Mti Waikundu just outright uh, replaces Ag Infusion as the Glacier Corp of choice, but I would disagree. 
I think the extra two influence from Agent Fusion will definitely come in handy, especially considering that Fairchild 3 is now off the most wanted list. You can run Fairchild 3 and Oval Carter in the same Jinteki Glacier deck. Better watch out, because that's something I'm gonna try. Finally, if there's one sleeper archetype that I think people will ignore until it's too late, I think it's Industrial Genomics. This identity has been well overshadowed by Potatoes, simply because Potatoes did a much better job of milling out the runner. But now that Potatoes is off the table, if there's one Jinteki ID that can do the kill, it's IG. It's going to be really, really annoying dealing with hostile infrastructures, breach domes in the bin, and yeah, it didn't get hit by the most wanted list at all. So IG, better watch out for it. If you're not ready to trash assets because the other four corp archetypes that you see here don't really run that many assets, IG can easily punish you for um, not being prepared for all the net damage. Yeah, you'll notice that uh, right now in the meta, there might not be a very good reason to play feedback filter even though you're Shaper, simply because uh, the more likely net uh, damage source is from meat damage uh, with hard hitting news decks. But yeah, industrial genomics, definitely something to watch out for. Um, there are enough good net damage cards in Jinteki as previously discussed, and this could easily be a deck that people just don't expect and don't know how to play against. Right, so that is all from me. I know this has been a super long podcast and uh, it's never nice listening to a monologue, but I hope you found this interesting or at least somewhat educational. Till next time, as always, thanks for watching and happy net running. See you then.